So our uh, next speaker uh, is Dr. Craig Pugh. He's a uh, geriatrician specializing in dementia and cognitive disorders at the North Neuroscience Institute's Memory Center. He has over uh, 25 years of experience evaluating and managing dementia, uh, and, and I'm very much looking forward to his topic today, neuroimaging in the diagnostic workup of dementia. So we'll turn it over to you, Greg. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, everybody see that? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, neuroimaging, uh, mostly in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, because it is such a key uh, uh, and critical uh, step in evaluating dementia. Uh, I have no disclosures to report. Uh, some objectives, so uh, hopefully you'll have a better understanding of the role of neuroimaging uh, in the evaluation of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to some visual rating scales that I think are helpful when we uh, uh, try to do a systematic sort of approach to assessing brain atrophy. Uh, I want to uh, uh, help you identify key brain regions that are commonly affected in Alzheimer's disease. And we'll talk a bit about uh, some of the MRI findings in atypical presentations of Alzheimer's disease, which are uh, um, uh, much more common, particularly amongst younger patients who present with uh, uh, early onset Alzheimer's. And then just briefly at the end, we'll talk a little bit about functional neuroimaging. We won't talk about amyloid uh, imaging in this talk, that will be uh, part of the biomarkers session. So from a historical perspective, uh, you know, most clinicians have thought that we do neuroimaging mostly to rule out other causes of dementia, so-called reversible causes, right? Tumors, subdural hematomas, hydrocephalus, stroke, et cetera. Uh, but the reality is that uh, those, those causes of dementia really account for less than about 1% of all cases. Uh, a more contemporary view of neuroimaging is that certain findings uh, when present really can help support a particular diagnosis. So we've gone from uh, a thought process of sort of ruling out things to now a more confirmatory um, approach where we uh, feel more confident ruling in a particular diagnosis. And really, uh, most clinical guidelines around the world uh, do recommend imaging at least once in the course of a person's evaluation for dementia. And uh, clearly, MRI is the first line modality recommended in most guidelines. Uh, MRI obviously uh, gives a substantially uh, greater resolution of brain structures. Uh, there's much uh, uh, more information that can be obtained about vascular changes. So, so really, it is the workhorse, the, the first-line uh, study for the majority of patients. It doesn't mean that there aren't uh, cases or situations where CT is uh, not appropriate, uh, particularly, obviously, patients with pacemakers, uh, claustrophobia, which is all too common, and then very old or frail patients, a CT scan may be perfectly acceptable. Uh, if possible, uh, uh, more information can be gathered from CT scans. If your radiologist can include coronal reconstructions uh, through the axis of the hippocampus, so one can get a sense of, is there hippocampal atrophy? And similarly, uh, if one can do sagittal reconstructions to look at, uh, at uh, posterior structures, uh, particularly the precuneus, which, which we'll talk more about. Now, different sequences on MR provide different information and have different value. When you're looking at atrophy, it's really the T1-weighted images that provide uh, the most clarity in terms of, of global or regional atrophy. Uh, T2-weighted scans and flare images certainly are, are sensitive to vascular changes in the white matter. Uh, and, and certainly we see a lot of white matter hyperintensities and microbleeds that usually represent small vessel um, pathology, uh, maybe due to hypertensive arteriopathy or cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And uh, white matter changes often coexist with Alzheimer's disease. T2 star-weighted images or gradient uh, recall echo or susceptibility-weighted images, which are so common now, uh, are sensitive for microbleeds and blood products. And then uh, we do quite a bit of volumetric imaging, and that requires a three-dimensional T1 uh, MP-RAGE sequence to uh, 
I'll prepare those images for the uh, uh, volumetric uh, programs. Now, there are some pitfalls in ordering MRI, and uh, we see this uh, not infrequently. Uh, for dementia evaluations, you, you really do not need gadolinium contrast. In fact, uh, um, the majority of guidelines, the American College of Radiology, recommends non-contrast studies in the majority of cases. There are some indications for gadolinium, uh, and that includes, in particular, very rapidly progressive dementias, uh, where there's a suspicion for infection or vasculitis. Most uh, uh, MR sequences nowadays do include diffusion-weighted images, and those are particularly uh, important when uh, evaluating rapidly progressive dementia, uh, particularly when we're considering things like creutzfeldt jakob disease, where we see restricted diffusion abnormalities in cortical ribbon or basal ganglia. Uh, but the majority of uh, uh, MRIs that we order uh, are non-contrast studies, uh, uh, either routine studies or, or, in certain cases, volumetric studies. With the advent of uh, anti-amyloid therapies, there are some additional considerations regarding uh, uh, field strengths. Uh, so, if possible, uh, a 3D, a 3T Tesla scanner is preferred. Uh, it does allow greater sensitivity, particularly for uh, uh, blood products that show up on susceptibility-weighted images. Uh, when we're thinking about patients who may be candidates for anti-amyloid therapies, where we're quite concerned about uh, how much white matter disease they have, how much, uh, how many microbleeds they have, uh, I think a 3T scanner is, is, is preferred. Uh, one can see uh, additional microbleeds, for example, suggested the amyloid angiopathy on a 3T scanner that might not be visible on a 1.5T scanner. But uh, for the majority of cases in, in routine clinical practice, a 1.5T MR is perfectly appropriate. I think one of the things to consider, particularly uh, if we're tracking things longitudinally, and we'll talk a bit more about that, is that it is important to image on the, the same scanner with the same field strength and vendor. It can be difficult um, to um, compare scans from different field strengths from different, different vendors. Uh, some general principles just related to neurodegeneration uh, in, in imaging. Uh, brain atrophy related to an underlying neurodegenerative process, it is progressive and, and it will worsen over time. Uh, that uh, um, uh, is, is just a general concept that holds true. And importantly, atrophy in neurodegeneration uh, does occur relatively fast compared to normal aging, so that even at intervals at one year or 18 months, uh, if one looks very carefully, one can frequently see changes in regional atrophy patterns within that time frame. And when we're talking about volumetric MRI, it's important to consider that brain volumes that are normal uh, when compared to a normative database but appear to be worsening over time uh, can suggest neurodegeneration even if the, the measures are still within uh, technically a normal range. And that's particularly true, for example, of, of hippocampal volumes, which with normal aging uh, uh, tend to shrink probably about 1% per year, uh, but more in the 4 to 5% uh, per year in, uh, say, Alzheimer's disease. And then longitudinal brain uh, quantification can improve the sensitivity and help uh, provide confidence in your diagnosis of the underlying pathology. So what do we see in, in Alzheimer's disease? Well, medial temporal lobe atrophy is uh, an early finding, and, and that's particularly true in late onset uh, patients with an amnestic presentation who are ApoE4 positive. That is really the, the sort of classic uh, initial finding in uh, your sort of garden variety uh, Alzheimer's presentation. And MRI studies do tell us that uh, hippocampal volumes uh, from anti-mortem MRI scans uh, do correlate uh, very strongly with BRAC neurofibrillary tangle patho pathologic staging, uh, amyloid. Uh, other areas that are frequently involved in Alzheimer's disease include the precuneus and the parietal lobes. And uh, an important um, finding that's uh, frequently observed is this anterior to posterior gradient of increasing severity so that 
the, the volumes in the anterior structures, the frontal lobes, uh, uh, are much well more preserved than the posterior uh, structures, such as the parietal lobes. And uh, I, I think it's helpful uh, to, to familiarize yourself with some visual rating scales, uh, particularly if, if you haven't looked at a lot of MRI scans. Uh, it's helpful to actually look at the pictures yourself and get a sense of how much atrophy there is, because you, you'll realize that the reports radiologists are, are often uh, more descriptive than they are uh, quantitative. And I, I think some quantification is more helpful. So the uh, most commonly used visual rating scale for medial temporal lobe atrophy is the so-called Shelton scale. And uh, it's a semi-quantitative score uh, from zero to four. And it's measured at the perpendicular, uh, perpendicular to the long axis of the hippocampus at the level of the anterior pons. And uh, uh, there is some debate, but a medial temporal lobe atrophy score, uh, it does increase with age, obviously, as the brain atrophies. Uh, but in general, if you're under 75, a score of two or greater would be considered abnormal. And greater than 75, a score of three or greater would be considered abnormal. And, and this provides uh, 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 essentially uh, examples of the scale where on the, on the um, far left there, uh, the um, uh, the region here that we're looking we're looking at the hippocampus. This is a normal hippocampus. It's nice and full. Uh, there's really uh, no atrophy. You can barely see the colloidal fissure at all. And this would be the corresponding finding on a CAT scan, which uh, you know because of the, the decreased resolution, all the structures tend to just blur together. Uh, this would be considered uh, a medial temporal lobe atrophy scale of one. You start to see a bit more uh, um, opening of the choroidal fissure, a little bit of loss of height of the hippocampal, uh, of the hippocampal structures. Again, on the CT, it's, it's somewhat difficult to make anything very clearly. A score of two here, uh, again, just increasing uh, height. A score of three, and finally, quite severe hippocampal atrophy here, where there's very little tissue left. Uh, essentially just a, a shriveled up hippocampus here. Uh, and again, the corresponding um, CT findings. Now, lots of times, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, if we just ask for an MRI, we don't get uh, coronal slices through the, the hippocampus. Uh, so we may need to look at the axial uh, slices to get a better sense of how much hippocampal atrophy there is. And uh, uh, this is a, a scale that uh, correlates very nicely with the uh, medial temporal lobe atrophy scale. And uh, if you look at the hippocampal structures here at the level of the midbrain, you get a sense of, of, of uh, progressive increasing hippocampal atrophy here. So we see lots of scans that uh, uh, axial images that look like this that are read out as sort of um, you know normal age-related atrophy, but this really does represent quite profound hippocampal atrophy, particularly uh, in the setting of somebody presenting with memory problems. Now, there are other scales that can uh, measure sort of global atrophy, and, and global atrophy is a bit more nonspecific, but uh, as a whole, uh, brain atrophy does correlate with, with cognitive abilities, uh, and uh, uh, certainly is a, uh, to some degree, a predictor of, of dementia. And uh, this is a scale that sort of uh, goes from zero to three and uh, demonstrates uh, different uh, levels of sort of opening and widening of the sulci here. So you get to this sort of knife blade like uh, atrophy, uh, in this case, in, in the parietal lobes. Uh, a, a scale you may not be familiar with that I think is helpful. Uh, because parietal, the parietal lobes and the posterior structures are so frequently affected in Alzheimer's disease is this posterior atrophy scale. And this uh, uh, ranges uh, from, from normal here to, to more severe, emphasizing particular brain regions, in particular the precuneus, which is this area uh, labeled up here, uh, the uh, posterior cingulate sulcus, which in the sagittal view is seen here, on the axial view here, and the uh, parieto occipital sulcus uh, back uh, between the occipital and parietal lobes, and then certainly the parietal 
cortical structures themselves. And you can see going down, we have more and more toroidal atrophy, widening of the posterior cingulate sulcus, shrinkage of the precuneus, and, and widening of this um, posterior cingulate sulcus. Again, uh, regions that are, are frequently heavily involved in Alzheimer's disease. And a proposed cut point in terms of what would be considered normal uh, would be anything less than two. Uh, so looking at these structures uh, can be very informative uh, in patients with cognitive problems. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, the atrophy patterns in Alzheimer's disease can be rather uh, uh, heterogeneous, and uh, you know it's not it's not uncommon for uh, patients to uh, ask, "Did my MRI scan show evidence of dementia? Did it show evidence of Alzheimer's disease?" Uh, and, and, and it's important to realize that uh, uh, you know there are findings that, like we've mentioned, that can be very suggestive of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but a person can have a completely normal brain scan and have Alzheimer's disease. And uh, this slide is meant to represent studies that have looked at progressive atrophy patterns in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And the majority of patients do have a, a typical presentation or a particular neuroimaging presentation, uh, which is represented here, where there is hippocampal atrophy as well as, as post, particularly posterior and more diffuse atrophy. But a number of patients, uh, close to about 20%, have what we might refer to as a limbic predominant presentation, where you see here there's really very little atrophy uh, in, in most of the cortical uh, regions, but there's quite profound hippocampal atrophy. And uh, a certain percentage of patients uh, uh, have only cortical atrophy in, in relatively well-preserved hippocampal volumes, and a, a much smaller percentage of patients have almost no atrophy uh, that's observable. Uh, uh, and interestingly, one study suggested that patients with a lower level of education may uh, be more likely to present with that finding, uh, perhaps related to cognitive reserve, lower cognitive reserve, and an earlier presentation at a, at a lower degree of uh, pathologic volume, if you will. Now, this slide represents uh, uh, essentially the same thing. This is from a systematic review and uh, demonstrates that uh, uh, cortical association areas and hippocampal involvement would be representative, sort of typical Alzheimer's disease. We, we have this group with minimal atrophy. And then this group that has more uh, cortical atrophy, the relatively preserved hippocampal volumes. And this is what we see uh, uh, frequently, particularly in early onset Alzheimer's disease, those that are APOE uh, non-carriers. Uh, uh, again, the non-amnestic presentations uh, that we'll talk about a little bit. And then this limbic predominant presentation where there's a lot of hippocampal loss, not much cortical volume loss. Uh, and this tends to be associated with much older aged individuals. Uh, it may be that uh, uh, recently recognized um, uh, uh, contributors like TDP43 encephalopathy, hippocampal sclerosis might be driving this presentation a bit more. Uh, so we, we do see that as well. Now the atrophy patterns, interestingly, do seem to have some prognostic uh, value in terms of how people progress. Uh, this is uh, a graph uh, demonstrating that. And uh, the bottom two uh, lines here represent patients who have sort of the typical Alzheimer's disease pattern with uh, a cortical and hippocampal volume loss and those with just cortical volume loss, as opposed to minimal uh, atrophy or limbic predominant atrophy. And you can see even over a course of two years, that those patients' MMNC score decline significantly more rapidly than those that have minimal atrophy or more uh, just limbic atrophy. And uh, I think we, we tend to see that as well, particularly if, if we recall that these patients who just have uh, uh, hippocampal atrophy and well-preserved cortical volumes, they tend to be much older. Uh, they often present with them am a very slowly progressive amnestic syndrome but as time goes by, often don't change a whole lot. Uh, so there are some implications in terms of what the uh, anatomy looks like in terms of progression that uh, can be valuable. 
I, I want to talk a little bit about vascular findings on MRI because they are so common. Uh, and uh, we need some means of sort of uh, thinking about the significance and, and understanding uh, what it is we're looking at. Uh, it's important to recognize that uh, covert, uh, which is the preferred term now, or, or silent strokes are really quite common amongst older people. Uh, when we put uh, patients in MR scanners in particular, I'm sure you've all had the, the uh, phenomenon of reading a report where there, there, you know, the coonar infarcts are found that the patient's not aware of. Now, these are usually due to small vessel disease, uh, intrinsic small vessel disease. Uh, less commonly, we find uh, um, sort of incidental cortical infarcts and uh, I recall one case not too long ago, a woman had four large cortical infarcts uh, and had uh, no symptoms uh, during during uh, you know, her uh, her lifetime. Uh, so sometimes you can find some things that are quite quite uh, impressive. Uh, other manifestations of small vessel disease really are, are extremely highly prevalent, and the challenge here, uh, particularly with these small vessel disease changes is that it may or may not play a large role in the clinical syndrome uh, that's in front of you that you're evaluating. Uh, it's important not to overcall vascular changes. It's important not to uh, underestimate the significance of them. It, it is a real challenge. I think one of the challenges as well is that reporting of these findings really is, is at the moment, it's not uniform, it's not standardized. Uh, reports typically say mild to moderate, severe, more than expected for age, less than expected for age. It's, it's really not very helpful, these uh, sort of vague descriptive terms, similar to, to uh, what we see with the atrophy descriptions. There are uh, a, a, There is a consensus group trying to standardize reporting the vascular changes on MRI. This is um, the STRIVE 2 uh, group. This is the second iteration. We're trying to standardize how uh, particularly small vessel changes are reported on neuroimaging uh, reports from radiologists. Uh, this is uh, an example of different kinds of small vessel disease and how prevalent it is. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, silent lacunar infarcts are, are exceedingly prevalent, and, and by the time people are in their 80s, about 20 to 30 percent of patients will have covert lacunar infarcts. Uh, it's increasingly recognized that uh, what we call cortical microinfarcts, which are very difficult to see, are common and, and uh, certainly contribute to uh, cognitive dysfunction. Uh, incidental, what, what's referred to as incidental diffusion-weighted images, in fact, are not rare. Where, uh, and this has occurred in, in uh, my practice about three times this year, uh, where people uh, get sent for a routine outpatient MR and they have an incidental diffusion-weighted image or abnormality, uh, uh, you know, is that is that a stroke? I think we probably would call that a stroke, but that's not a rare phenomenon. Uh, uh, up to one to two percent or so of patients who are elderly and put in scanners will, will find this. And it's interesting, these lesions, when you track them, some of them turn into lacunes, some of them disappear, uh, some of them uh, result in a new white matter lesion. So it's an area uh, of sort of active investigation and Exactly what to do with this is uh, in the immediate time frame. It's, it's uh, still uh, um, under consideration, and certainly you're familiar with white matter hyperintensities. And this uh, um, chart represents patients with severe uh, white matter disease. So again, white matter intensities, white matter hyperintensity, are very common, uh, and a large number of patients who are elderly have quite severe white matter changes. And uh, other small vessel changes relate to dilated perivascular spaces uh, seen in the centrum semi-ovale or the basal ganglia. And then uh, now with the um, frequent uh, addition of, of uh, GRE or susceptibility-weighted images, it is not unusual at all uh, for uh, patients uh, to be found to have um, chemosiderin staining or cerebral microbleeds and again, uh, up to you know a third of patients in their 80s will be found to have uh, cerebral microbleeds on their neuroimaging. And finally, uh, cortical superficial siderosis, a more concerning finding that uh, really uh, uh, represents the most specific finding for cerebral amyloid angiopathy. That's uh, much less common, but we do see that.
white matter hyperintensities, they can be graded. Uh, the, the most common scale is the Fazekas scale. And uh, you can see going from one to grade three, uh, mostly grade one consists of a thin rim of white matter hyperintensity around the, the uh, um, uh, periventricular regions. Grade two, you start to see a bit of confluent uh, regions in, in the deep white matter. And then grade three are these large confluent um, regions. Now, now uh, how much white matter disease is required to, to uh, result in cognitive impairment is not clear. Uh, there are patients that have quite severe white matter disease who don't have cognitive impairment. Uh, there are patients who have uh, sort of mild or more moderate to severe white matter disease. They have lots of impairment. And I think the point that's important is that these kinds of white matter changes, they are associated with an increased risk of stroke. They're associated with a risk for all-cause dementia, not just vascular dementia. And uh, it's increasingly recognized that gait and mobility, balance problems, mood disorders like depression and uh, apathy, and urinary symptoms, particularly uh, urge urinary symptoms, urge incontinence, are all associated with these kinds of more severe white matter changes in particular. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about neuroimaging and atypical presentations. We talked about what we tend to see in, in typical presentations. Realize Alzheimer's disease can have uh, uh, atypical uh, presentations and these things are characterized uh, as a uh, language variant or a visual variant or a behavioral or frontal variant, uh, logopenic uh, PPA, posterior cortical atrophy, and uh, behavioral variant Alzheimer's disease. Again, uh, it's, it's uh, more likely uh, that we tend to see these in younger patients, although uh, they can present at any age. So we'll show you a, a few cases that uh, bring some of this uh, to life here. Uh, cases from, from our clinic. So uh, the first case here is a 76-year-old woman with five years of progressive memory problems. Uh, her family describes her as, as, as being repetitive, uh, asking the same questions frequently, telling the same stories. Uh, she started to do some uh, unusual things like placing dishes and other items in the wrong cabinets, forgetting to turn off the stove, uh, forgetting conversations and, and uh, recent television shows and movies that she's seen with her husband. Uh, and more recently, uh, has had difficulty with her sense of navigation uh, and got lost while driving. Uh, she has little concern about her memory and uh, was somewhat irritated that her uh, husband brought her in for evaluation. And uh, this, uh, uh, so... So we referred her for neuroimaging as well as other unusual evaluations. And this was her neuroimaging um, uh, on the uh, um, flare images. And you can see she really has quite severe uh, white matter disease. So you might be uh, tempted to say, well, geez, this is a case of vascular dementia. Uh, but I, I think if we think about the presentation, this is really an amnestic disorder, progressive amnestic disorder uh, that, that uh, may now start to involve some uh, visual spatial or, or topographical kinds of uh, uh, difficulties. This is the same patient, and in this case, we did a volumetric MRI, and what you see, uh, again, we saw the white matter disease, but what you see here, particularly in the right hippocampal region, it is profound atrophy, uh, uh, so that uh, these uh, graphs represent normative uh, hippocampal volumes from patients of the same age. And uh, you can see her right hippocampal volume is, is certainly below the third percentile. And uh, uh, even though it doesn't look too bad, uh, the actual volumetrics on the left hippocampal volume are quite impaired so that the overall hippocampal volume is in the third percentile. Uh, again, this is, this is indicative of neurodegeneration of some sort. And uh, in this particular case, given the age, the presentation, uh, this suggests Alzheimer's disease. So that uh, uh, the vascular uh, findings that we see are important, but we are likely uh, certainly dealing with a mixed vascular neurodegenerative process. <laughs> 
Another case uh, was a 64-year-old female who presented with a two-year history of word-finding problems. Her sister noted that, uh, who came with her, that she had to frequently fill in her words during conversations that the patient couldn't come up with the words she was looking for. Uh, the patient herself was uh, independent, residing alone, and uh, was increasingly frustrated and began to become uh, more socially isolated because of her difficulty in finding words. And interestingly, uh, as she talked, uh, it was observed that she made occasional uh, phonemic and uh, semantic uh, paraphasic errors in her spontaneous speech. Uh, on exam, she had marked anomia, meaning she had difficulty naming uh, pictures that were presented to her, uh, decreased fluency uh, in asking people to name as many words as they can think of from a, a, a letter as well as from a category, and uh, difficulty in repeating uh, uh, longer phrases and sentences. And uh, this just gives you a sense of how you might uh, evaluate this in the clinic, showing a person a picture and asking them uh, to describe in as much detail what's happening in the picture, uh, tends to bring out word finding pauses, uh, uh, circumlocution errors where people talk around the word, uh, word substitutions, asking people to name items uh, of, of somewhat lower frequency, uh, and then having people repeat uh, prolonged, um, increasingly prolonged sentences uh, is helpful. Uh, so this is her MRI, and uh, uh, it, you know it's quite striking actually. Uh, you see a marked degree of asymmetry here in the temporal and, and to some degree the parietal structures in the left language regions. Uh, in the, on the coronal views, it's also very striking. And then in the um, sagittal views, you see this marked volume loss in, this peri in these parasylvian structures here. Uh, so really a very dramatic finding and uh, very asymmetric. And if she had volumetric studies, uh, again, temporal lobe gray matter volume is, is well, well below the third percentile. Uh, there is atrophy in the left parietal lobes. Uh, this, this star here represents uh, uh, measurements below the, uh, uh, I believe it's the, the fifth or third percentile. Uh, again, everything is very, very asymmetric here. And uh, this is a case of uh, logopenic variant primary progressive aphasia uh, due to Alzheimer's disease. Another case uh, is a 72-year-old uh, woman uh, who presented with troubles dressing herself. Her husband said that she often had troubles putting on her sweaters or clothes. Things would be turned upside down, inside out. Uh, had trouble orienting her arms through the sleeves. He noted that uh, she had trouble finding objects that were located directly in front of her. And interestingly, I had trouble sort of uh, going up and down escalators, going down the stairs. Uh, she, she became very fearful of... Uh, of uh, going downstairs and riding escalators. And uh, uh, her primary care physician had done MMSC, and interestingly, she was perfectly oriented, uh, only missed one on recall. Uh, but an important clue here in, with the history is that uh, she was unable to copy pentagons and had some trouble with uh, uh, either uh, world backwards or serial sevens on, on the attention aspect. And uh, this is the kind of thing, uh, this, this woman probably has a progressive visual perceptual syndrome. And uh, these are the kinds of things that you know, we might uh, look at uh, at the bedside, asking people to read fragmented letters, to identify uh, fragmented objects, to, to identify overlapping figures, uh, and to recognize um, what you're seeing in these uh, Navon figures where you should be able to recognize both the H and the S's in both the circles and the triangles. And um, uh, if I remember correctly, this woman uh, could not read any of these letters. She didn't perceive any letters uh, in this um, simple test. And she was only able to identify one of the overlapping figures um, uh, in, in these kinds of drawings. And, and uh, when shown these pictures, could only identify the S but not the H. And, and that's a phenomenon that we refer to as simultagnosia, uh, and that's a, a common finding in these uh, visual perceptual um, presentations of Alzheimer's disease. 
And, and this is a third MRI scan. And you see, again, we talked about this uh, anterior to posterior gradient of atrophy. And you see here, for the most part, that the, the anterior structures are reasonably well preserved. But there's fairly profound atrophy of the uh, parietal structures. This posterior cingulate sulcus is, is very wide open. There's atrophy here in the precunians as well. And uh, this woman presented uh, with a you know, you know, clinical presentation consistent with posterior cortical atrophy. And indeed, uh, uh, she underwent an FDG PET scan, which showed uh, bilateral temporal parietal hypometabolism with additional hypometabolism in the occipital lobes, and ultimately underwent CSF biomarker testing, which was consistent with Alzheimer's disease pathology, and uh, actually is now on um, anti-amyloid agents with lecanemide. A bit about functional neuroimaging, uh, SPECT and FDG PET. Uh, this, uh, particularly FDG PET, has been sort of a workforce uh, for dementia evaluations for some time. And uh, it, does, it, it does provide a measure of synaptic dysfunction. And uh, changes on FDG PET scan can be seen uh, generally uh, before there are any structural changes on, on uh, MR or CT. Uh, it does provide evidence for neurodegeneration. And there's a variety of groups that have published appropriate use criteria uh, in the workup of um, dementia. Uh, I, I tend to find it a very helpful tool and uh, use it not infrequently. Uh, it can be useful, uh, and, and this is the, the, the uh, indication that uh, uh, is covered by CMS. Uh, can be useful for distinguishing between Alzheimer's disease and uh, frontotemporal um, etiology, frontotemporal dementia. Uh, this is the one indication where CMS uh, generally provides coverage when uh, after a uh, usual evaluation, uh, there's still some uncertainty that the person have Alzheimer's disease or do they have FTD. Uh, it also can support a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, uh, it can be quite useful in some of these atypical uh, variants of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, also can be useful in distinguishing between dementia Lewy bodies and Alzheimer's disease and uh, help support a diagnosis of one of the primary progressive aphasia syndromes. Uh, in Alzheimer's disease, th there is a characteristic pattern uh, that's observed. Uh, abnormal findings on FDG PET uh, uh, are associated with an increased uh, risk of progression to dementia in patients with mild cognitive impairment. Uh, so it does have some prognostic value in cases of uh, MCI. And, uh, and also importantly, uh, if the findings are normal, even in patients with mild cognitive impairment, uh, in general, their prognosis is quite good over the next, uh, say, three to five years. And uh, the same thing holds true actually with biomarker testing in patients with MCI, those that uh, lack evidence of Alzheimer's biomarkers similarly have a favorable uh, prognosis over the next several years. Uh, in Alzheimer's disease, typical findings on FDG PET include bilateral temporal parietal hypometabolism, involvement of the posterior cingulate and the precuneus. Uh, and like I said, even in MCI, one can see some uh, subtle temporal parietal hypometabolism uh, you can imagine in the atypical Alzheimer's presentations that uh, uh, we tend to see the same uh, mirroring of, of where we observe atrophy in more profound cases, but uh, sometimes there is not much atrophy in patients with these language uh, presentations or um, uh, visual perceptual presentations, and the FDG PET can be quite helpful there. And it's also useful in distinguishing between Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body disease, where uh, in uh, uh, Lewy body disease, uh, the posterior cingulate region tends not to be involved, uh, resulting in the so-called cingulate island sign, where there are regions of preserved uh, metabolism. The posterior cingulate is, is uh, usually involved in um, Alzheimer's disease. And in dementia with Lewy bodies, as well as PCA, posterior cortical atrophy, uh, involvement of the occipital lobe is, uh, is common and frequent. And uh, there may be some subtle uh, 
changes that can help distinguish between that. One paper suggested that if there is profound asymmetry on the occipital lobes uh, in terms of hypometabolism, that that is more suggestive of PCA than Lewy body disease, but can be difficult to distinguish. Uh, so in summary, uh, I, I think it is helpful to think of neuroimaging as not only ruling out unusual causes, uh, but it is able to provide insight into the underlying etiology. I find it helpful to look at the scans and have some familiarity with really what does represent a significant degree of atrophy and uh, utilizing um, visual rating scales can be uh, helpful there. The vascular lesions are, are certainly exceedingly common and it can be challenging to determine uh, how significant they are um, in terms of the patient's presentation. It might, might explain everything. It might um, be relatively incidental and not have a, a whole lot of impact. Um, and then volumetric MRI uh, can be useful in uh, supporting specific uh, diagnosis and, and can be tracked over time, uh, suggesting uh, an underlying neurodegenerative process. And that gets to the point of serial neuroimaging either with structural MRI or PET. Uh, so again, sometimes repeating things, and this is not infrequently done in memory clinics around the world, but sometimes re repeating things at sort of the one year or the 18 month point um, can be insightful uh, in terms of does a person have a progressive <laughs> neurodegenerative disorder or not? Uh, so, that, so that's pretty much it in terms of uh, what I wanted to cover today. Well, Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Uh, we have time for just a couple questions before we uh, head to a break. Uh, so first of all, can you uh, comment at least briefly on Medicare coverage or maybe insurance coverage broadly for these modalities? Yeah, again, I mean, the, the only coverage I'm aware of, uh, I haven't personally had lots of difficulty in, in getting uh, FDG PET, uh, uh, but the one, the one coverage that I, I know is approved is uh, is this distinction between AD and FTD? Uh, so so I, I think that the rules read something to the to the point that if a person's had a standard evaluation, uh, uh, you know, cognitive testing, lab, structural neuroimaging, and there is still uncertainty as to whether this represents AD or FTD, and you word it that way, uh, that Medicare will cover that. Um, that that is the uh, um, sort of uh, most um, and for the MRI volumetrics, that is typically covered, correct? Uh, I, I believe so. I believe so. Uh, it doesn't really add a whole lot um, to, to the um, to the scanning sequences, and, and as you know, it's all sort of automated and uh, uh, done on cloud servers and so forth. <laughs> so, one other uh, before we break here. Uh, and you touched on this, but I think it's worth reiterating. Uh, in terms of um, sort of repeat imaging, so if a patient's already been diagnosed with dementia, uh, would you repeat the images, or if so, under what circumstances would you repeat the images? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, I, I think the most value in terms of repeating images in patients where you still have a, a lot of uncertainty is to uh, what the diagnosis is or whether it really represents a neurodegenerative process. And, and uh, you know, that can be challenging. There, there are, there are uh, you know, lots of uh, patients around the world in memory clinics that uh, uh, people are not certain what's wrong with them. And uh, periodic and longitudinal follow-up, both clinically and uh, radiographically, could be insightful. I, I think I wouldn't, uh, I, I tend to feel that patients deserve at least one neuroimaging in the course of their evaluation. I wouldn't routinely repeat it after that if I'm confident of a, a diagnosis, unless there was some dramatic uh, and profound change that, that uh, uh, suggested um, an additional uh, pathology, an additional contribution. That, that makes sense. All right, well, thanks again, Dr. Pugh.